Uh, next, I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about our upcoming events. We have a bunch of them, uh, and uh, you might want to consider several of them even. Uh, Larry Lipscher coming up next Tuesday. Many of you, of you know him, a prominent uh, accountant. He's going to talk about how U.S. and mainland Chinese tax laws have changed. So if you are somebody who is a U.S. citizen, U.S. green card holder, or if you're somebody who spends a lot of time in mainland China and might become liable for, for Chinese taxes, or if you're somebody who invests in China, uh, all those rules have changed for this year. Uh, second, uh, we have on Wednesday of next week, Matt Friedman, and he is uh, going to discuss modern human slavery. He is from the Mekong Group. They have done some tremendous work in addressing uh, trafficking all over, particularly Southeast Asia, but also around the world, and I think you'll find him a really engaging speaker on that subject, a very sad subject. On Thursday of next week, we have uh, Chandra Nair, and he'll be speaking about uh, everyday entrepreneurs, not the Li Kashings, uh, not necessarily some of the famous business leaders you've heard of, but people who are making a difference in a lot of small ways all over the world and who are entrepreneurs. And then finally, on Monday of the following week, May 11, we have Tobias Brandner, and he is a pastor who specializes in caring for and helping the people who are in Hong Kong's prisons. So if that is something, of uh, prison conditions here are a concern to you, uh, whether or not you think you might someday end up there, uh, if you're concerned just about sort of how people are treated in the prisons, uh, uh, this is somebody who knows them better than practically anybody uh, from just years of going in, uh, anybody in a non-official capacity. So uh, he'll be very interesting a uh, week after next Monday. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, uh, someone whom many of you must know, long, somebody who's been a member here uh, for many years, uh, former uh, editor-in-chief of the Hong Kong Standard, of the South China Morning Post, former Asia Regional Editor for uh, Business Week, author of a number of books on subjects like the World Trade Organization, now the leader of the Asia Business Council, which really brings together many of the most important CEOs in Asia. And he's here to talk today uh, about, uh, about his new book. Uh, some of you may have seen it's the lead review in the new issue of The Economist, really a glowing review. And so we're very happy to have him here to tell us about the book. Mark. Well, thank you very much, uh, Keith. Um, Nice to be here. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. Hi, Paul. Haven't seen you for a while. Um, I'm not a member anymore. I gave up my membership when I left journalism, unfortunately. It's one of the things I, I miss, but nice to see a lot of you. Um, well, um, thanks for uh, that really kind introduction, um, uh, and I'm going to talk about part of the, the book, um, which uh, came out earlier this month, and um, yeah, it was, it was very Nice to have that review in The Economist. That definitely made uh, my week. Um, I do want to uh, thank uh, a couple of my colleagues. Uh, Janet Pau is um, the program director for the Asia Business Council, and Jack Marr is our Princeton in Asia fellow. Uh, uh, both of them helped uh, enormously over the course of uh, doing this book, which is uh, The Greening of Asia, the business case for solving Asia's environmental emergency. Um, there's uh, a, a lot to... Uh, to um, talk about, of course, because Asia has a lot of environmental problems. My, so I'll tell you just very, very briefly about the book, and then I'm going to focus the talk uh, on China. Uh, Keith asked me to talk for about 15 minutes, and then we should have about 20 minutes for, for Q&A, I guess. Um, I did reporting from um, eight countries as well as Hong Kong. Uh, I've broken it down thematically into a number of areas, um, sort of focused on energy, focused on cities and the building envir built environment and on natural resources, water and forestry. But um, today I want to focus on this place, which um, we think is Beijing on a bad winter's day, but it could have been a lot of places, I guess. Um, and um, I, I probably don't really um, need to remind you, because I, I think everybody here is pretty familiar, familiar with the situation. And um, it's a disaster. Um, I mean, I think we all know that Asia has a lot of environmental problems, but I was staggered during the course of doing the research for this book to find out um, really how, how bad it is. Um, and initially, actually, in fact, I, I, when I had the idea for this, I thought of writing a book called The East is Black, and that would have been pretty obvious and pretty easy. Um, uh, and in fact, funnily enough, Sandy Burton um, of the Burton Room wrote a piece, uh, I think, about 10 years ago with a similar title in 
time, maybe it was more than 10 years ago by now, which the Chinese authorities didn't, um, didn't take kindly to. Um, but the situation has just gone from, from bad to worse. And uh, I don't want to in any sense sugarcoat the, the problems. We can, again, we can talk about them in, Q, in the Q&A, but this is unabashedly a glass half full kind of book. I'm trying to look at, we've got a disaster. How are we going to, is there a way out? And I think there is. And um, today I want to focus on China, which is the most important country in terms of the global cleanup. Um, and I want, to, I want to look at the ways in which I think China is moving forward. And I'm going to particularly focus on air pollution and, uh, and um, greenhouse gases, and uh, especially on coal, because it's really coal that's at the, the heart of our global environmental and um, energy problem. And China um, burns more of it than anybody else in the world. In fact, uh, sorry, there aren't too many slides with all these numbers, but just a few numbers. Uh, China is burns about half of all the coal in the world every year. Um, China, mostly because of coal, is uh, responsible for close to a third of all the greenhouse gas emissions, which are linked to global warming. Um, about 1.2 million people every year die prematurely because of outdoor air pollution alone. Um, and then just a couple other stats. So 70% of China's carbon emissions are from coal. 90% of its sulfur dioxide emissions are from coal. And so the carbon dioxide, it doesn't hurt you. It's not a pollutant. It's, it's odorless, colorless, but it's a greenhouse gas and it's linked to, to global warming. The sulfur dioxide is the nasty stuff that's a major component in the air pollution that kills all these people. So they're, you know, coal is bad on, really bad on both counts. Um, so in my book, I, I mostly focus on business and what business is doing because I think it's businesses that day in and day out um, solve problems. They take challenges and um, make opportunities out of them. Uh, and a lot of it is very granular, ground up kind of reporting on what businesses are actually doing. But uh, business doesn't act in a vacuum. Uh, I'll talk more about the government role, but the, the other side, so I see a kind of three-legged stool, business, government, and civil society. And I think all of you know that um, civil society in, in China, despite the enormous pressure it's under, is increasingly important. Um, so we see a lot of localized protests, typically against um, chemical factories and other uh, highly polluting industries. So far, these have been very much in the category of what I would call NIMBY, not in my backyard. Uh, you know, and they're not any kind of national movement. But I think, uh, I think all of us saw the reaction to Chai Jing's um, quite stunning uh, documentary, Under the Dome. And usually people say that was downloaded 200 million times. Um, Jack did some research on the web, and it looked like it was downloaded more like 300 million times in those, those first couple weeks. 200 million, 300 million. Who knows? A lot of people in China saw that. It had an enormous impact. Um, I think we all know it had such an enormous impact that the government decided it should be scrubbed from the web. But I think it, this shows the importance of civil society, even in a Chinese context, maybe especially in a Chinese context, and um, of the need for the Chinese government to, in turn, take action. And um, I think that China really is uh, moving to take action. We had, uh, when we were originally putting this presentation together, we had lots and lots of slides about everything that China's doing. We can talk more about this in the, um, in the Q&A if you like, but basically, in a nutshell, since 2007, the, starting the top leadership in China has made increasingly bold and assertive um, comments and promises uh, regarding uh, climate change and air pollution. And so I've just, uh, I've just picked one announcement, which is one that, I don't know if Keith wrote about it, but certainly the New York Times did, which was the, the announcement last November that uh, uh, by Xi Jinping that uh, China's emissions, uh, carbon emissions, would peak around 2030. This is the first time that China has uh, announced a firm date. It's actually one of the first times it's even talked about that. In fact, uh, the research that we've done suggests that the peak could and probably will come earlier than that. Um, uh, but what's it going to take to get there? Uh, so coal use has to peak by the mid-2020s. Um, we probably will need uh, some sort of a carbon tax uh, to speed the transition to away from fossil fuels and away from coal. Um, and uh, as part of that, that transition in 2030, uh, we're going to see clean energy increasing to about 20% of, uh, of the total. Uh, coal right now is about 70%, so clean energy has to take a lot of that. 
the numbers are are absolutely staggering, and I don't want to you know to talk like this just you know barrage you with numbers. But on the next uh, page, I'm going to show you a little bit about what this is going to mean. This 800 to 1,000 gigawatts of clean energy that, that China is going to need. Um, on the left uh, part of the screen, the green bar is what 1,000 gigawatts of new uh, power looks like, clean clean tech. The black bar is China's total capacity to generate electricity now. It's about 1,400 gigawatts. The blue bar is what the U.S.'s total is now, a little over 1,000. The next two ones are uh, Germany and Japan today. So you've got the largest four economies in the world, and you see that what, first of all, you see how much larger the U.S. and China are than everyone else in terms of uh, electrical generating capacity. And so really, the, the climate wars are going to be largely won and lost, depending on what the U.S. and China do. But you see the enormity of, of China's promises. If it, if it builds this thousand, it's got a couple hundred gigawatts now, mostly hydro, um, wind, and to a lesser extent, solar. But if China really builds that thousand gigawatts out now, I mean, it's, it's more than... It's more than, well, it's more than any other country other than the U.S., but it's an enormous amount of power to, to build. Um, so let me talk uh, for the next, I don't know, five or ten minutes or so about, about solar and wind. Um, I, don't want to, um, I, I don't want to ignore the fact that uh, clean tech for China also includes hydro. As I said, hydro is, is uh, about 200 uh, gigawatts right now, so it's, a, it's, a, it's very, very important. Nuclear, um, again, I know, Keith, you've written about nuclear a lot. China has the most ambitious nuclear program in the world, and it'll barely be a drop in the bucket. I mean, if it's, if it's finished by, 20, or by 2020, they're expecting, I think, 57, 58 gigawatts, almost as much as France, and it'll be a couple of percentage points. I mean, it's tiny, so nuclear really doesn't, doesn't move the, the needle for China. Hydro um, uh, does, but solar and wind are increasingly uh, important, and I think all of you know that China is the, the world's largest um, solar manufacturer of solar panels. Um, it didn't actually used to use many of those panels at home. It used to send them to places like Germany and um, Spain and Italy and the U.S. And a series of, um, uh, I would call them protectionist uh, moves, uh, made it much more difficult for the Chinese to, to sell into that market. I know, Keith, you've written about this a lot, so you probably know much more about this than I do. But a variety of, of anti-dumping and, uh, and other moves made it much harder for China to sell which in a way turned out to be a blessing in disguise because it put a floor under the, um, the pricing for Chinese solar manufacturers and saved some of them, I believe, from bankruptcy, although it's, been a, it's not been a profitable uh, industry. It's been really crazy. And in, in my book, I talk about SunTech in particular, which had been the world's largest solar manufacturer and then went bust because it expanded too quickly and made some bad business decisions. But um, SunTech's loss and the loss of the individual Chinese companies in terms of profitability has really been the rest of the world's gains because we've seen solar prices fall more than 80% because of Chinese manufacturing capabilities in the last decade. Um, but as the, as the international markets have become more difficult, uh, China's um, turned to, to the home market. And uh, in the first quarter of this year alone, it installed five gigawatts of new solar capacity, which... Um, given the fact that Germany is the largest in the world with 38, is, um, is almost unbelievable. Uh, again, I don't know how well you can see the bar chart, but China is the red part on the top, and you see that five years ago it was basically nothing, um, and now it's, it's very significant. The blue in the middle is, the, is Europe, which has had very aggressive support for solar power and is big in absolute terms, but um, as we saw from the previous slide, um, China is about to surpass that. Um, the other um, industry to talk about, I think, in terms of clean tech is, is wind. Um, at the end of 2014, China was by far the largest wind, uh, uh, well, not producer, but had the most wind capacity in the world with 115 gigawatts, which, again, is more than many countries' total um, generating capacity. Wind um, is ex extremely cost-effective. It's uh, often the typically the second uh, most cost-effective uh, energy after coal. Um, but China has, uh, has some problems here because although they have, a, somewhat, they have all this capacity, um, the U.S. actually produces more electric power from wind because it actually hooks the turbines up to the grid and actually uses the wind. Um, I think a lot of the problems that we see in other parts of the Chinese economy, we see writ large in the elect electricity sector and the grid sector. And this is something China is going to have to 
um, straighten out if it really wants to um, reap the benefits of its investment in, um, in clean technologies. So um, uh, yeah, as I said, the U.S. still generates more electricity from wind, but on a theoretical basis at least, the wind's potential is almost limitless in China. There's a guy at Harvard, M Michael McElroy, who's done uh, research with a uh, team at Tsinghua as well as researchers from Harvard, and um, he estimates that wind could actually meet all of China's electricity needs by 2030. This is highly theoretical, but the point is wind is there, it's cost effective. At this point, it's as much a matter of getting the grid right and getting the policies right and really uh, making sure that these assets generate electricity and that the electricity is really used. Um, so again, similar uh, to the solar chart, but even more dramatic, 10 years ago, China had almost no wind capacity uh, domestically, and it didn't export wind turbines then, and it really doesn't export many now. It's a very different picture than in solar. Uh, China went through, um, I know this is something Keith has written about because you wrote about the WTO disputes with it. China went through a really aggressive localization program where foreign manufacturer share of wind turbine went from, I think, by memory, 78% to about 14% in under a decade as China um, uh, just did everything it could to uh, create a domestic industry, which has been pretty successful domestically, but has had uh, real difficulties uh, exporting. Very different story than solar. So I'm going to, um, you know, not just keep going through all these numbers. I'm not going to give a long talk about uh, what I think China's policies have been other than the, uh, the Xi Jinping, Barack Obama um, uh, landmark agreement. But we can talk about that more in the Q&A. We can talk about uh, other countries. Singapore is a place that uh, I talk about at great length in the book because I think they've done um, a remarkable job. But uh, I think it's important to remember that you know, although there are a lot of problems and profitability of individual companies, the actual policies of, of getting things like wind from the turbine to, you know, electricity that's actually lighting buildings and cooling buildings, that, um, you know, this, this is for real. This is not smoke and mirrors. China spent about $89 billion last year on clean tech, according to uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which uh, the U.S. was in the low 50s. So it spent about two-thirds more than the U.S., Almost every year for the last five or so, China spent more on clean tech than the U.S. Um, the rest of Asia is also spending a lot, and so we didn't, you know, we have a fair, fairly short time today. But um, I've, I think you would be impressed as you look around the region to see what's going on. The uh, Asia ex, ex China again; these are Bloomberg New Energy Finance figures. Spent in a bit over sixty billion dollars, almost exactly the same as the e EU did. So yes, there are more people here. Uh, but Asia is playing catch up, and it's really, I think, putting the money into it. It's putting the resources, and again, what I found out, it's putting a lot of um, not only government uh, initiatives and government policies, but a lot of a lot of corporate work as well. And what works the best, uh, I found, is when government, business, and civil society are working together. That we're using prices as much as possible to drive change, as opposed to super detailed regulations, and that. Businesses are really given the, the, uh, the lead and the direction to do what they do best, which is to solve this kind of problem and make it look a bit more like this, which occasionally it does in China, in Beijing. So thanks very much. I'd love, thanks for coming, and I'd love to take questions. So, yeah. Well, I can't resist if I can start off by a qu asking a question then on whether China has done as well as it has on clean energy uh, by breaking a lot of, of, of trade rules that other countries were trying to follow. And you're one of the few people here who's written a book on WTO and a book on China clean energy. I'll never forget going to a solar panel manufacturer five years ago in Changsha and uh, it was. It had a downtown location. Ninety-five percent of its sales, like the rest of the Chinese solar industry, were exports. It was a local professor who'd gone to the city government. He'd been allowed because it was a solar energy factory to buy land for a third of the official industrial price for Greater Changsha. So already that's a subsidy to get it so cheaply. And then on top of that, this wasn't just any location. It was in the middle of downtown Chang Changsha. He had 20 hectares in the middle of downtown Changsha for a third of the official industrial rate. It was across the street from 20-story apartment towers, which sold for 20 times that price per hectare. After only two years, he could convert the land and move the factory somewhere else and use, convert it to residential. 
So you make a lot of money there. The, the, the heads of the banks, uh, one of the head of the province for one of the big four Chinese banks had come to him with all of his top entourage to say, please borrow more money. And so at the lowest rate possible for large SOEs, even though he was a startup, and then on top of that, he said the provincial government was paying three of the five percentage points of interest for him. Now, naturally then, Chinese solar production went through the roof, and in two years, 24 European and American solar companies either went bankrupt or closed their factories. Was, and yet, on the flip side, I can see from an environmental point of view, it's great for the world, maybe, if solar panel prices went down 80%. So the question is, how do you, as somebody who's written books about the importance of free trade rules and WTO, balance the environmental impact with the arguable breaking of the export subsidy law bans under WTO? Yeah. I, I think if China want to get, wants to give us free solar panels, that's great. I mean, I, I really do. I mean, yeah. I mean, they, that's not what U.S. Uh, trade courts found. You know, they didn't they didn't agree with that, but. Um, I think I think you've you've answered the question, and I think it's it's really interesting because um, uh, there's a long discussion of SunTech in the in the book and detailing the subsidies and other help that they got. At one point, there were more than 600 solar companies in China for exactly the reasons. I mean, the the craziness in the solar business was basically underpriced land, underpriced capital, often underpriced labor, as well as other subsidies on top of it. Um, uh, meant that solar, just like steel and a lot of other industries in China, suffered and probably still does suffer from massive overproduction. I think ultimately they've done the world a favor, um, although it is interesting on the environmental side, uh, off the, as you probably know very well, these, these solar factories are not often very nice. They're really nasty and dirty places because they're basically low-end semiconductor fabs. And uh, so it's probably great if you get the free panel and you're in Arizona it might not be so good for the Chinese. So, you know, it is funny that on the one hand, they have arguably uh, broken trade laws. On the other hand, they're, off, they're hurting themselves in, in their own way in some sense. But I think in terms of what they've done, done for the world, they have permanently, forever and everywhere, brought solar prices down and pushed the, the adoption of that technology far more quickly than anybody thought possible. Absolutely true. Okay, next question. Over here uh, in the corner. Uh, Two questions over Hi, I'm Christian Schubert with uh, BASF um, Chemical Company, and of course we would clearly support your view of uh, the opportunities that new technologies, new materials have in um, uh, helping to address some of these uh, challenges. I wanted to ask you a question on regulation. Um, I must admit I didn't read the book, but in the review um, it said that one of the points that you're addressing is regulation as a key driver um, to address these challenges. Um, this, I mean, you're showing a lot of innovation and a strong push in terms of technology in China. Do you also see a similar um, trend when it comes to regulation? Is there some innovations in how China is going to regulate? Are there new ideas that we also could learn from in the West? Any smart regulation that uh, we haven't thought of yet? Hmm. Um, I'm probably not enough of an expert to give a, a really knowledgeable answer about that, but what worries me about China is that there's often a very, you know, really, really detailed regulations that are very top down that aren't always that effective. So I think an area like green, green buildings is an interesting example because China talks a lot about green buildings. It has policies to promote green buildings. It knows that it's actually cheaper uh, when you count everybody's costs to build a building that's efficient than to build an energy inefficient building and then build a thermal power plant, even the cheapest, nastiest coal plant, it still costs about four times as much over the life of the building to build the inefficient building in the coal plant and the transmission. And though even economically, forget that there's an, even an environmental uh, impact from coal, as bad as it is, economically it makes more sense for China to build green buildings. They've known this, uh, they, actually what I've just cited to you comes from some work the Asia Business Council did uh, in a book on green buildings in 2007. So, the economics are probably more compelling today, and yet China, for all its policies and for all its top-down regulation, can't make this transition to green buildings, which is one of the greatest opportunities they have. So I'm not, I haven't seen, you know, again, and I'm not an expert in this area, but I have not seen 
people beating the door to China to say, wow, you've got some great form of regulation. I happen, I'm a simple person, but I happen to think that prices work better because companies can decide. So I think if you put a, let's say, $37 you know, tax on carbon uh, for coal, that uh, that would make the transition a lot faster than having you know, tens of thousands of bureaucrats trying to you know, look at every little thing. And uh, I think that I think coal needs to start paying its own way. It's cheap only because we're not looking at those 1.2 million deaths. We're not looking at the deaths of the miners. We're not looking at the externalities. So, and unfortunately, I don't see China moving in that, moving in a price oriented direction. It's not, it's not how they regulate. And next to you, please. So, thanks very much for the talk. You, in the book title, it's the business case, although in the speech title, you didn't mention the business case. Um, but the only business you mentioned was SunTech, which went bust. Right. So I was wondering if you can give us, um, in your research, you must have found someone who's doing it right. So who is any shining example of someone who did make a good business case and is doing sure. well by yeah. doing good? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, most of the book, that's really what most of the book is, is on, is, um, is the businesses that are doing it well. So it's lots of sort of uh, granular bottom-up stories. So I don't know, in Manila, I think Manila Water has done a terrific job uh, on, on the water delivery side when, when government had you know, just wasn't able to deliver water to people. Um, here in Hong Kong, I think Marjorie Yang uh, of Escal, you know, major textile company, a billion dollar plus a year in sales. They make uh, more than 100 million sort of men's shirts like this and polo shirts. And, you know, it's done an, a, a really a terrific job on water in particular, but energy more generally. China Light and Power has made a, a commitment that it will effectively decarbonize by the middle of the century. They're an you know, old coal-burning utility, and they woke up and realized they could, they could end up with stranded assets if they didn't start looking ahead over the horizon. And you know, the Kaduri family has you know, been involved for more than 100 years, and they'd probably like to be involved the next century, and they don't want to see their investment wither because they're stuck with a lot of technology that's going to be more or less done away with. So, um, you know, I think they're in the back of the book, there's an appendix of 50 or 60 companies, sort of thumbnail sketches, and it could have been 500 or 600, honestly. I mean, this book was really a kind of introduction, and I've just felt that the business side, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at what uh, NGOs and civil society and the media are doing. We spent a lot of time parsing uh, various government directives and policies, but we're not looking at, you know, who really makes this work in the, in the real world. So um, I, I guess uh, in terms of solar, that's tougher. I think solar is just a really, really tough business. Um, I'd say in in uh, in wind, you have you have you have sort of Sinovel, which fell apart because it uh, seemingly stole other people's technology. But you have Goldwind, which is now the second largest uh, wind turbine maker in the world, and it started by a sort of crazy dreamer from Xinjiang who, um, you know, during the 1980s in the reform era, the promise of, of you know, free power from wind, I think, sim seemed to just really capture his imagination. So here was a, you know, a teacher who just didn't want to spend his, you know, his life in a classroom, and he's built this amazing company. So, um, um, yeah, I don't know. Is that, yeah. Over here, please. Thank you, MK from Watt McDonald. You talked about the water, or you touched on water a minute ago. I just wonder whether or not any of the aspects that you uh, looked at uh, relate to the pollution of water uh, from these uh, clean tech. Mm. For example, uh, you also touched on the fact that um, solar is not actually as nice and clean as uh, everybody likes to think. Has it been, because it's all about money, has there been any analysis done on whole life costing associated with the pollution in the water? Because I think everybody sees the air quality issues, but they don't necessarily yeah. recognize that water is even more uh, tragic in yeah. terms of China. And last week, the China Action Plan was issued, and the court was to provide 90% of urban dwellers with water, but that didn't say clean water, fit for drinking water. It just said water, so that's 90% for 2020. Yeah. Thank but you. The water demand yeah. is huge. Yeah. Uh, look, I, it, it's a great question. I guess in, on solar specifically, there's been some work done. I didn't go into that in any detail, but I think you're absolutely right. And maybe the analogy I'd use is I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 70s, early 80s, and at that time, there, you know, Silicon Valley said, hey, we're clean tech, it's wonderful, a new world. But one of the first stories I covered was about TCE, which is this very bad chemical, which is used in you know, electronics manufacturing, which was seeping into the groundwater. And I think this is an issue all over China. So I mean, you, the water issues in China are 
something that it's hard to be very positive about. So maybe that's why I didn't cover it too much in my book. But you know, I, I think there are people like like Margie Yang and others who realize that there will be a price on water someday. I mean, the, the well, let me back up a bit. The companies that I found were most interesting was where you had a chairman or a CEO who was sort of looking over the horizon. And in Margie's case, she says, carbon and water are underpriced. They're gonna, there's going to be a fuller price on them someday, and we're going to be held to account. And interestingly, they're in the Pearl River Delta. Their major uh, factory is. And so they're not as worried about getting water because there's a lot of water down here. They're wor more worried that the government will put restrictions on how, what they can discharge and the quality of the water they're discharging. And, yeah, there are a handful of companies, but there's still a handful that are trying to look ahead and trying to experiment and do the right thing. Systemically, I don't know because, I mean, I think you bring up an excellent point. I mean, water is a hard stop issue. People don't have water. You know, you, okay, a million people die a year. It's horrible, of course. But you don't have water for a couple days and, you know, you're finished, right? So um, I, I don't know. I don't, you know, China still seems to have this very top-down engineering model to solving these problems. Oh, we don't have water in Beijing. Let's tap the Himalayas with, you know, big water diversion project. That's not really going to solve the problem of an area where you have basically per capita water that's more or less what Saudi Arabia is, and yet they're still in northern China, and yet they're still growing wheat there. So um, I don't know. I, I can't be too ho hopeful on that front. Sorry, a new book. The East is, the East is dry and thirsty. <laughs> Richard. Richard. Yeah, uh, just stepping back a little bit from the, the China focus, uh, but not entirely. Uh, India, of course, has huge water and, and, and uh, pollution problems as well. And there's a, some growing interaction between China and India. On the business side of things, what, are you seeing some lesson learned on either the government or the business side between China and India as they try to solve, in some respects, very similar problems? Um, I actually haven't been to India since, um, since the election when, when Modi took power, but um, as of a year or so ago, not really. And uh, I actually am really concerned about India. I mean, the whole world is focused on China for you know, reasons that I, I think some of the numbers I gave uh, might, have, might have given reason to believe. But you know, India now is growing really fast, maybe faster than China from a smaller base. But uh, Modi has said full steam ahead with coal. Um, I don't, you know, maybe they're making progress on water, but I mean, they've been talking about their infrastructure problems in India for, you know, since I started going there in the early 90s. And it's just gone from mostly from bad to worse. The good news about India is that there is a lot of solar and wind. There's a lot in terms of green buildings. India has to some extent, or at least the corporate sector, taken advantage of its weaknesses, i.e. not enough electricity, or reliable electricity, not enough water. So you've seen a lot of corporates, say Infosys is a good example, where they're building really green buildings and they do a lot of rain harvesting, use a lot of solar, because they can't, they can't you know, count on getting water from outside or getting electricity. Um, there's big solar and wind. China Light and Power, actually, CLP is the biggest uh, foreign investor in wind in India, and uh, you know, which I think shows again their sort of long-term thinking and their regional reach. Um, but um, you know, I, I don't know because Modi has has really, really thought that he should follow the China coal model, as far as I can tell, and I haven't looked at it really closely. I don't know. I mean, as you, you're right, Richard, that there seems to be more talk about cooperation between China and India, but, you know, there's also a lot of suspicion, too. So, Sherry? Hi. Hi. Uh, I wonder if you can put uh, the pace of change in China in uh, a broader historical perspective in terms of the changes that other countries, namely you know, Japan from the 1970s, United States even from the 1970s, have gone through the industrialization process and then started to clean up. Um, does, does the involvement of business and the development of clean technologies make that process faster? Where are we on that historical timeline? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question, and I don't know if I can give you a good answer, but I give you a little bit of perspective. Um, I mean, China is just so big that it's hard to really compare it. But in the U.S., um, I can give you a sense of how long things take. Um, in the U.S., Rachel Carson wrote her book, The Silent Spring, in 1962. It wasn't until 1970 that the Environmental Protection Agency was set up. Um, it wasn't until 19, a, a full decade later, until 1972, that DDT was outlawed, which is really what she was um, was after. Uh, it did take the the 
um, Cuyahoga River in um, uh, Ohio um, catching on fire in 1969 to really spur action. And I think a lot of people have looked for a kind of what they call a silent spring moment in China. Um, maybe the air apocalypse of a year or two ago uh, was one of those moments with, with Chai Jing's documentary sort of you flip them around, if the air apocalypse is Cuyahoga River catching on fire and then Chai Jing is Rachel Carson. I mean, you can see some parallels. It takes a long time to turn economies and it wasn't, uh, I mean, I could be wrong, I'm not an expert on the US, but I think it wasn't really until the 1980s that people really started seeing, um, you know, especially in a lot of the kind of northeastern cities where there was a lot of coal and you had a lot of acid rain issues and things. It wasn't really until the 80s that things started getting cleaner. So. Unfortunately, it seems to take sort of 10 or more years, and I don't know how far, in, if you date it back to 2007, which is when Hu Jintao first started talking about this as an issue, then okay, we're, you know, most of the way through that decade. If you date it back to last November, or then we're, we've just started. I actually think that we're closer, that there's maybe more room for optimism um, than I would have thought even six or 12 months ago. And, I don't know if you've written on this, Keith, or maybe you can and um, help illuminate it, but there's a lot of debate because China's coal use actually fell last year and it wasn't projected to fall until the mid-2020s at the earliest. And part of the reason seems to be that hydro was, was really strong, but, and part of the reason is the economy's a little weaker. Uh, things like steel and, and real energy intensive industries were, were using less, uh, less power. But, there is some thinking that China can see peak coal use by 2020 instead of, say, 2025, and that would be huge. Um, so I think, I think that what China's done is laid out targets, say, when Xi Jinping made the agreement with Barack Obama, that are not super aggressive. They're quite doable. And um, uh, in, doing, in trying to get ready for this talk and really go through, um, you know, Jack and I spent a lot of time going through what's actually happening with coal. And this has a global impact. This is the first time since the IEA has started looking at numbers 40 years ago, absent, absent a, uh, a severe global downturn, that emissions have not gone up. And they haven't come out with full data, but it, China's a big part of that. And the move to renewable energy and the move away from coal is, um, is a big part of that. So. I, yeah, I don't know, but I actually think we might be surprised on the on the upside. Uh, so I would say, I would hope that within five years we've really turned the corner on coal and we can really start seeing, um, you know, cleaner skies in China. So there are some signs of that. Uh, Joel, please. Mark, welcome back. Joel Thanks, Lincoln, Joel. Yep. Nice to Secretary see you. Secretary General of the IPBF, that's the Independent Power Producers Forum. I'm really curious, this is sort of a geopolitical thing. Last summer, President Xi, President Obama, signed off with a bunch of documents about coal, coal capture, clean this and clean that, in Beijing. The guy that crafted all this, uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Energy, Julio Friedman, and he sort of heads up a think tank, it's IDOE. He's up there now, I think working on the next bunch of papers, possibly assisted by their executive director, uh, Sam Tam, who heads up the coal capture section of UAE. What does this all mean? Is it going to be cosmetic? Is it really going to be sparks flying? Is this all part of uh, greater cooperation between DOV and their Chinese counterparts? I'm just curious what you're taking. Yeah, I think China's doing this for its own reasons. I think if it can get some, uh, some credibility globally, it would like that. Um, It'll be very interesting to see what comes out of the Paris, um, meet, you know, climate talks this year. I mean, you know, they've gone, this is what, year 21 or something they're going on. And every year it's, they're wringing their hands and saying something has to change. Um, China and the U.S. really have to lead. Um, you know, we're, we're Americans. I can't speak for America, but, you know, there's still a lot of people who don't think global warming is real in America. That debate is over in Asia. I mean, you don't hear that in China. I think China looks at the impact of climate change. It looks at water issues in China, which are huge and are going to be much more erratic as a result of, uh, of climate change. It looks at the cost of a million plus people a year dying prematurely because of air pollution. And China says, we've got to do something. We got dirty. We're not rich, but we're a little better off than we were. We got to get clean. And so, although I think there's a, an important geopolitical aspect, I think what's most important is that China is doing this for its own internal reasons. Okay, we have time for one more question and back in the corner, there we go. 
Hi, it's uh, Justine Lau from None But China Light and Power. <laughs> um, I just want to ask a question. I mean, we are doing our best in China and India, but I mean, one argument that we often use is that well, we have to. We still. I mean, at the same time, we still bur burning a lot of coal. An argument that we always use is that well, because a lot of people still need electricity, and the easiest and the cheapest way to supply that is through burning coal. I mean, do you agree with that argument? And the other thing is, um, well, okay, we do we do burn coal. We know that it's dirty, so we use like super critical technology to make it clean. Again, how helpful is this in the I mean in the science way? Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I think the sooner we can get rid of coal, the better. But as you say, people want electricity. I think what has been interesting is when governments set targets and they set prices and they have policies, the transition can happen much more quickly than people realize. And I think what we've seen in the last decade or so with solar power, with wind power, uh, with a variety of other technologies show that we can move away from coal more quickly than, than we had thought possible. As I said before, I think coal doesn't pay its true price because it's not paying for the, you know, what do you say to the 1.2 million families who lost some, lose somebody every year because, mostly because of coal. I mean, how do you put a price on human life? How do you look at the, the impact on um, global warming? I mean, you know, when people try to put a price on coal, all of a sudden it's not the cheapest uh, form of energy anymore. And I think what, what we're seeing, I think we've seen progress that would have been unimaginable 10 years ago in part because of uh, these very, you know, the, the aggressive uh, pro policies of, of the Chinese government of Chinese solar and wind companies. But uh, I think over the next 10 years, particularly as we get into storage, because storage is sort of the holy grail at this point. If, if your great wind turbines can blow all night and then we can use the power during the day because we have some kind of battery storage, it makes the economics different. So I guess in summary, I'd say that um, coal is uh, a, something we should dispense with as soon as, as practical, but we need, we need a roadmap. Obviously, we're not going to turn off Castle Peak tomorrow. You know, it's one of the world's largest coal burning facilities. And, um, uh, but we need, I think we need a roadmap to get out. But in talking to Andrew Brandler, Richard Lancaster, you know, they can't do it alone. I mean, gov the government has to set the rule and has to, we all have to agree as a society, okay, if coal costs, you know, X more and we're going to use wind instead, you know, who's going to pay for it? Are we going to pay twice as much for our electricity, et cetera, et cetera? You, you, you know these arguments. I think what's interesting about CLP is we have an example of one of the most forward-looking companies in the world. I don't, I don't offhand know of another major utility that said it's going to effectively decarbonize by the middle of the century, and um, except maybe some have been forced by the government. You have a private company that just sort of decided this, and I think it's, it's great, but CLP can't do it alone. And you, in a way, you've had a wonderful uh, success in the last 10 years or so, but uh, again, talking to some of your executives, you know, it's like the easy part has been done and now we really need, we need real government policies that, that lay out a framework for where we're all going. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Even if you have for now renounced your membership in the club, you still, <laughs> still got a tie. tie. Thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, we hope many of you will want to buy his book out front. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.